Dragons and dinosaurs, our moon's magnetic field, and Earth's water. We explain these mysteries here on Genesis Week. Welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins controversy, made possible by you, the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education. Excellence in pirate broadcasting, we continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and we give glory to our creator while doing it. We believe God gave you an intelligently designed brain for a reason, and we do hope that you brought it with you this week. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in genesisweek.com where you can find us, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and get extras like Crevo rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juvi. Live Science had an interesting article on dragons and dragon legends this past week. It was interesting to see the admissions by a secular news reporting agency in this article, the admission that dragon legends are prolific in pretty much every single culture in the world, and the admission that far too many of these legends bear a non-mythological realism to them, as well as a resemblance to dinosaurs. Author Benjamin Radford starts off by acknowledging how prolific dragons are in so many cultures literally all over the world. He then states that nobody knows how, where, or why the stories of dragons first emerged. Well, here's a proposition for you. Perhaps it's because there were dragons all over the world in historic times. Gee, what a concept! The question then arises, just what is a dragon? Even the Bible mentions dragons, so just what is a dragon? Now, we all have this culturally instilled picture of what a dragon supposedly looks like, but the typical dragon we think of is a mythologized chimera. That is, it's a combination of all the different types of dragons, blended into one which has been exaggerated in typical mythology fashion. When one looks at the specific descriptions of specific dragons, several things come to light. And I agree with Radford when he quotes the book of Job in the Bible. The behemoth and leviathan described in chapters 40 and 41 would be dragons of some sort, but also could be dinosaurs. Now the name dinosaur was coined by Sir Richard Owen in 1841. English translations of the Bible were written before this word was invented, which is why you do not see the word dinosaur in the Bible. Now, Richard Owen was the founder of what is now the British Museum of Natural History. Now, before the term dinosaur became commonplace, and in fact for quite a while afterwards, the dinosaurs were called dragons. You can still see some of the historic fossils in the British Museum with dragon written on the stone slab. As Radford even acknowledges, the dragon legends and descriptions are so specific, so prolific, that the link between dragons and dinosaurs is too specific to be ignored. Entire books have been written on the subject, documenting the depictions of dinosaurs in ancient artwork, uh, such as David Wetzel's Chronicles of Dinosauria, and Vance Nelson's book of dozens of new examples, Dire Dragons. Another example which Vance shared on this show was a native pictograph in the Amazon jungle. Only one example of many from around the world, in still yet another isolated culture, which depicts what is clearly a large sauropod-like creature being hunted in the typical fashion by the tribesmen. Vance hopes to get a booklet out in April documenting this one specific fantastic find. Don Patton and Dennis Swift pursued reports of what appeared to be a stegosaurus carving on the temple pillars of Thai Prom, Cambodia, dedicated in 1186 AD. The plates going down the back 
or a dig giveaway. That's a Stegosaurus. But even descriptions from historical accounts are too specific and quite believable. Both Herodotus and Aristotle spoke of small flying reptiles in Egypt, Arabia, and Ethiopia. They described them as small in size and of various colors, with a snake-like body and bat-like wings. Flocks of them would gather in frankincense trees, and when the workers wanted to harvest the trees, they would use smelly smoke to make the reptiles leave, much like a beekeeper uses smoke to keep bees at bay when working on a hive. In 1572, a farmer in northern Italy was going along with his oxen, which were startled by a strange baby lizard. The farmer killed the creature by smacking it on the head with his walking stick. Ulysses Aldrovandus obtained the body of the dragon, drew it, and had it mounted in a museum. Aldrovandus concluded it was a baby because of its incompletely developed claws and teeth. Now, while strange looking, if we were to find this creature in fossil form, there is no doubt we would call it a type of dinosaur. In the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle of 1405, we find a story of a strange and dangerous creature. Close to the town of Burris near Sudbury, there has lately appeared to the great herd of the countryside a dragon, vast in body with a crested head, teeth like a saw, and a tail extending to an enormous length. Having slaughtered the shepherd of the flock, it devoured many sheep. In order to destroy him, all the country people around were summoned. But when the dragon saw that he was again to be assailed with arrows, he fled into a marsh or mere and there hid himself among the long reeds and was no more seen. The description of this dragon is very believable and so specific that we could easily suggest it matches the description of the Dilophosaurus, the two-crested dragon, or using the more modern term, a two-crested dinosaur. But herein lies the problem. According to the evolution myth, dinosaurs became extinct at least 60 million years before humans ever evolved. Therefore, if evolution is true, then humans and dinosaurs never saw each other. According to the scriptures, though, all land creatures, which would include the dinosaurs, and humans were created on the same day, day six of the creation week, about 6,000 years ago. The book of Job, with its description of dinosaur-like creatures, was written after the flood of Noah. So the dinosaurs would have been brought on the ark and survived for at least a time after the flood, dwindling in numbers until they are very rare or possibly extinct today. So the evolutionists must account for these copious numbers of very specific, identifiable dragon stories and drawings that sound remarkably like dinosaurs, living in historic times. Well, how can they explain this? Radford verbalizes the exact argument that many have pulled out of their hat in an attempt to explain away these dragon dinosaur legends. The belief in dragons was based not just in legend, but also in hard evidence, or so it seemed. For millennia, no one knew what to make of the giant bones that were occasionally unearthed around the globe. The dragons seemed a logical choice for people who had no knowledge of dinosaurs. In other words, these people must have excavated fossil dinosaur bones and then built stories surrounding these fascinating bones. Now, that's a wonderful ad hoc explanation that just doesn't cut it for very many good reasons. For example, the stegosaurus carving. Stegosaurus fossils have never been found in Cambodia. In fact, stegosaurus fossils have only been found on the other side of the planet in North America. And now, in, as of 2007, some were found in Western Europe. Furthermore, as anybody who knows anything about fossil dinosaurs, you almost never find the entire dinosaur you'll find a jumble of ripped apart bones here and probably never find anything else. Even when you do find a relatively complete skeleton, it is usually ripped to pieces and some interpretation is required to piece it back together. That interpretation is usually accomplished by finding parts that are still joined together here and there. In other words, almost invariably, 
you must find and excavate many separate dinosaur skeletons. Now this is why Sue the T-Rex was so valuable. The skeleton was astonishingly complete. Now when you see a dinosaur skeleton in a museum, almost invariably what you are looking at is a composite of multiple skeletons found at multiple locations. In fact, often many of those bones are sculpted, handmade and scaled up from bones that were found from a different size of that same kind of dinosaur. To find and excavate any dinosaur bones requires an enormous amount of work. To find enough bones to make an identifiable skeleton requires exponentially more work and excavation. For example, the Iguanodon, as it was originally constructed and originally described, was radically different from what we know now, after many more skeletons were found and studied by many people over many years. Now, I have been involved in the process of finding, excavating, preparing, molding, and casting dinosaur bones from beginning to end. It's thousands of man hours involved, large, dedicated facilities, many people. Today the modern day museum is where this all typically takes place. But to give you an idea of just how big a job it is, this plaster jacket of dinosaur bone, still in the rock matrix at a dig site in northern Colorado, was being excavated by Joe Taylor of Mount Blanco Fossil Museum and the Creation Evidence Museum, both of Texas. That lump of rock may contain a dozen or so bones and weighs upwards around 500 pounds. Now, a few hundred years from now, archaeologists searching out the remains of our now-dead culture would find the remains of our fossil excavation and preparation facilities. This is because the process is so involved and requires such large facilities of so many people. So when we are talking about legends and artwork depicting dinosaurs, Remember, we're talking about all kinds of different cultures. Ancient Europe, ancient Babylon, tribal cultures in the Amazon rainforest, the Hopi Indians of North America. If these cultures were excavating dinosaurs, we would find archaeological evidence of such. We find no such archaeological evidence or historical evidence in any of these cultures. Further to that, both the verbal and artistic depictions of these dinosaurs refer to details such as skin. It is only after a century and a half of studies from around the world, millions of man hours of research, millions of tons of technical equipment, and thousands and thousands of fossil dinosaur remains that we are able to say what little we can about dinosaur skin because fossil dinosaur skin is exceedingly rare. It's big news if dinosaur skin impressions or actual fossilized skin is found because it is so rare. So how did the ancients provide such details of identifiable dinosaurs, including specific details about their skin and colors? Well, the simplest, most logical explanation for all of this is that the ancient peoples saw living dinosaurs. Now, why is that so hard to believe? Well, there is only one reason. Evolutionism. Evolutionism demands millions of years. Evolutionism demands that dinosaurs became extinct millions of years before humans evolved. Even evolutionary scholars have admitted that if humans and dinosaurs lived at the same time, evolution would be destroyed and falsified as a theory. Well, here we have evidence that humans and dinosaurs coexisted by artwork and legends. We also find fossil evidence, such as the clearly human footprints alongside and sometimes in the fossil dinosaur tracks in the Paluxy River and elsewhere in the world. But on top of that, the fossil dinosaur themselves provide powerful evidence that even the dead dinosaurs have only been dead for thousands of years, not millions. You'll recall the publication by Dr. Mary Schweitzer several moons ago about finding soft and stretchy tissues from inside a T-Rex bone, complete with blood vessels containing red blood cells. Now, this was only one example of many found over the past century. 
Many of you longtime viewers will remember we had Mark Armitage on the show and actually showing bone cells and stretchy tissues from a triceratops horn found in Montana. Uh, just this past week, Mark revealed some more footage in high definition on his YouTube channel. You can go and look at the video footage yourself. Now, it is impossible, flat out impossible, for these tissues to have been preserved for millions of years. Even more impossible is the apparent DNA still found in these tissues. DNA decays far, far faster than the soft tissues themselves. Another compound that decays in an absolute maximum of 100,000 years is carbon-14. Yet large quantities of carbon-14 have been found in dinosaur bones, wood fragments from the dinosaur bearing layers, etc. All of this shows that even the dead dinosaurs have only been dead within the time of mankind. Now, leading evolutionists have admitted that if dinosaurs and humans lived at the same time, it falsifies evolution and affirms a young Earth and the biblical creation account. By examining fossil, chemical, and historical data, we find multiple lines of copious evidence that man and dinosaurs did live together, and only in the past few thousand years. If the Bible's right about that, I wonder what else it's right about. Interestingly, a report came out regarding our moon's incredibly powerful and unexpected magnetic field. Now, I should stop right there. Unexpected? Unexpected by whom? Unexpected by the evolutionists only. According to evolutionary theory, the moon is billions of years old and was too small, and now too old and too dead to have, or ever have had, a magnetic field. However, studies on lunar rocks have shown that not only did the moon have a magnetic field in the past, it had a magnetic field that may have been as much or more as 40% more powerful than Earth's present magnetic field. How on Earth could a body that's just slightly more than a quarter the size of Earth generate a magnetic field as much as 40% more powerful than Earth's? Weiss and Taku, writing in Science Magazine, acknowledged this uh, problem, though please note there is no problem. It is a man-made problem because it does not fit evolutionary models of lunar evolution. May I suggest to you that the data is not the problem, but rather evolutionary and naturalistic models are the problem. These models don't fit the facts. That's the problem. Weiss and Taku waxed eloquently in their paper about how this past magnetic field would demand that the moon had a very hot molten interior. Thus, allegedly this supports the impact hypothesis that a planet perhaps the size of Mars crashed into Earth, producing an incredible amount of heat and knocking off a big chunk, which would become the moon. Now, I'll ignore the problems with that theory, which we've expounded upon in previous shows, and simply point out that their wild speculations are based on assumptions which are not necessarily true, such as the age of the moon. And all are still inadequate to explain the moon's magnetic field. Their admission in an interview with ABC is very telling. Regardless of the mechanism which kept the lunar core molten, Weiss and Taku still can't explain why the moon's magnetic field would have been so strong in the past. The findings suggest that our understanding of how planets form magnetic fields is incomplete, says Weiss. So evolutionary and naturalistic theories of the formation of the moon are completely lacking in even explanatory power, let alone predictive power. Such models provide only questions, impossibilities, no answers, and failed predictions. Retired Sandia National Labs physicist, Dr. D. Russell Humphreys, took one of the most powerful steps you can take in science. He made predictions based on the biblical creation model for planetary magnetic fields. Now, predictive power is one of the strongest tests of any scientific model. 
evolutionary models made multiple predictions about planetary magnetic fields. So Humphreys asked the question, if creation were true, what would the evidence be? Now as he read his Bible, he noted that in the beginning, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So based on the principle that the earth, planets, and moons were first created from water, Humphreys made a single second assumption that when created, the polarity of all of the atoms were aligned. This would produce a magnetic field around all of the planets and all of the created moons. He could then calculate, using well-established physics, what the initial magnetic moment was and how well it would or would not be preserved today, based upon what we know of the present composition of those planets and moons. In 1984, Dr. Russell Humphreys published a paper in the Creation Research Society Quarterly predicting the magnetic fields of planets and moons throughout our solar system. At the time of publication, the past and present magnetic fields of Mercury, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto had not yet been measured by spacecraft. Of the six predictions, five have proven right on the mark, whereas the evolutionary predictions have completely failed, leaving the naturalists scratching their heads. The sixth prediction pertains to Pluto, which will be visited by NASA's New Horizons spacecraft next July. Notice that Humphrey's incredibly successful model, based upon the young universe, the biblical creation account, had planets and moons with initial strong magnetic fields and lots of water. This not only explains our moon's past magnetic field, as well as the magnetic fields of all the other planets, this brings us to our next story, and our next mystery for naturalistic models. The origin of water on planet Earth. It is a mystery to the naturalistic models. If the moon formed from an impact with Earth, then most of Earth's volatiles, such as water and light elements, should have boiled off and been lost to space. So for years, naturalists have rejected the scriptures which tell us plainly what the Earth was like at creation. And the Earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The naturalists must account for the copious amounts of water on Earth, somehow, because their own models show the water shouldn't be here. So they look to the stars, and in particular, comets, which are basically big icy snowballs. They figured a whole mess of comets must have hit the earth, accumulating the incredible volume of water now collected in our oceans. The Rosetta mission made international headlines last month when their spacecraft landed a probe on a comet. A most remarkable feat. Bef now before that happened though, the mothership if you will, had already taken measurements of the comet's tail and found that the composition of the water within the comet was radically different than Earth's water. See, water naturally has heavy water in it, which is water that has a hydrogen atom with an extra neutron. This form of hydrogen is called deuterium. Well, it turns out this comet's water has about three times as much deuterium as Earth's water which effectively rules out comets as the source of Earth's water. Well, I know the source of Earth's water. It was created by the same one who said, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. That same creator said that in order to obtain that everlasting life, you must be born again turning from your sins, asking him for forgiveness, giving your life to him, and he promises you the gift of the Holy Spirit and eternal life. Stick around, we'll be back in a flash. To the horror of both fans and enemies, Ian Juby is back with more ranting goodness. Okay, Jacques. 
you first. Just when you thought his meds had kicked in, Ian goes off on a tangent about what killed the dinosaurs. The origin of life, defining evolution, and yes, even sex. It wasn't enough for an R rating, but nowadays, what is? Volume 4 of his ever popular and ever hated Karevo Rants has eight new short, fast, funny, and hard hitting episodes. You can get your copy on the soon to be extinct DVD for 15 bucks plus shipping and handling, or purchase the instant digital download of all eight tracks for just eight bucks. Or you can buy all four volumes of his world infamous rants for the price of three. Order your copies today and have a party with like popcorn and stuff. Visit Ian's bookstore today. people spotted an error I made in last week's show regarding right and left-handed proteins, like the Exodus 2011. I think Ian got left-handed and right-handed mixed up. Proteins used left-handed amino acids, but his argument still stands. Yes, you are all correct. Life is composed of left-handed amino acids, not right. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks again, Ian. I very much enjoy your videos. I hope they keep coming. Slow claps. Thank you, Ian. As someone who doesn't have the time to study science as she'd like to, I am extremely grateful for your continued affirmation that logic is the only true, necessary tool to divine truth in a world filled with lies. I appreciate your hard work and pray that God will bless you and CORE for your continuing work to put heavy science into a format that can be easily understood and to the benefit of God's kingdom. Thanks to Stephanie and all who wrote in. All right, I went way over time this week, so I got to call that a wrap. I'm your host, Ian Juby, signing off for now. Remember, you can send us your questions, comments, hate mail, and Tim Horton's gift certificate to us in a number of ways. You can email us at comments at genesisweek.com, or you can send us a tweet at genesisweek, or you can go to genesisweek.com, which takes you to our YouTube channel, find the most recent show, and leave a comment there. Or you can visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash genesisweektv. Remember those words of warning from our creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We'll see you on the flip side. We are a viewer-supported program and need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K 2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at ianjuby.org slash donations. And thank you for your support.